So this is the chapter overview video for chapter 11, Angular Momentum. Your textbook breaks up the uh, topics a little bit weirdly. I would have covered angular momentum alongside, you know, fixed axis rotation. But uh, your textbook splits it off uh, into a chapter, okay? And then put, it puts uh, rolling motion into this uh, chapter, which uh, rolling motion actually doesn't have to have uh, anything to do with angular momentum. But in any case, it's there. Um, rolling motion is an important um, situation to be aware of when you are doing problem solving around the rigid body motion. Especially the condition of rolling without sleeping is something that's going to come up a lot. Uh, in many questions involving where things are rolling, we might, we might say things to indicate it's rolling without sleeping. And that's important because it'll give you a way to introduce a one new equation or you know reduce your number of unknowns through this relationship that the motion of the center of mass velocity of center of mass can be related to angular uh, velocity through this relationship here there's this equation 11.1 .1, velocity of center of mass is equal to radius of the thing that's rotating times its angular velocity. Now, as you look at it, uh, this might somehow seem familiar to you, like, uh, you know, as if, uh, like, uh, you already knew that. I didn't need to be told this. If it looked familiar to you, that's because when we talked about rotation of variable, we talked about, for example, relating the, the angular velocity to the tangential velocity of the point on the edge. So the velocity of the tangent, um, Point, the tangential velocity of a point at the edge uh, to the angular velocity and that tangential velocity is equal to radius times angular velocity and yeah that's uh, um, uh, that, that that's exactly the same relationship actually so what rolling motion without sleeping allows you to do is uh, uh, you give that tie and through that tie of this point not moving you can make the statement about the motion of the center of mass um, relative to um, like fixed surface. So so that's the rolling motion. Uh, that's the kind of the important condition and the rest is kind of application of that. I think I have an, um, a, a few different analysis of uh, rolling of an object, a disc down an inclined plane. Take a look at the lecture. Um, and I think let's see, yeah, rolling motion. And uh, when you have a rolling motion without sleeping, that would be, that's one of the scenarios. So I think uh, I've mentioned uh, at the beginning of the semester that we try to ignore friction whenever we can. And uh, that would be, you know, when we problem doesn't mention friction. And rolling without sleeping will be one of the scenarios where you can't ignore friction. Like in this scenario, when you are describing it, you might not see any mention of friction, you know, until you see this. Um, but uh, you actually need the friction force to make sure it does not slip. And you can see that in the analysis, you have to introduce this friction force. And um, so, yeah, yeah. The, so whenever you see rolling motion without slipping, think of friction. There must be friction to allow, to allow it to roll without slipping. Uh, so uh, conservation of mechanical energy. So I think we talked about uh, the uh, rotational uh, kinetic energy. And the way this particular expression is written, the total energy being broken out this way, uh, potential energy term plus two different kinetic energy terms. Uh, one that re it's related to motion of the center of mass and another that's related to rotation about the center of mass, which explains the expression for the rotation inertia about the center of mass. This is one way you can always write down uh, total kinetic energy of any object. You can always break it into two pieces, one dealing with the translational motion of center of mass, another dealing with the rotational motion uh, about the center of mass. You can always write it that way. You should uh, have this option um, in mind. Now, uh, one of the ways we will sometimes go is somehow f figure out a way to treat this as completely rotational motion. And uh, you can actually treat something like rolling without sleeping as uh, like 100% rotation. And the way you would do it is you would look at this and you would uh, treat this uh, point of contact as your 
um, at the moment in time, your rotational axis. And you can treat this entire thing as a pure rotation. And when you do that, you have to remember to use the correct expression for the rotational inertia. You will have to use parallel axis theorem to calculate the rotational inertia about this point and use that. And um, so you could do that when something is rolling without slipping. Now, the moment it begins to slip, the moment something doesn't have a fixed point, you can use as an actual center of rotation. Then, uh, then you can use this as a backup. This is an expression. This, um, the breaking things down into motion of the center, translational motion of center of mass, and the rotational motion about the center of mass. That's something you can always do, uh, no matter what situation. So. So yeah, that's the conservation of energy expression. And um, and uh, this rolling without slipping has nothing to do with angular momentum. Again, I don't know why they put it in this chapter, but hey, it's here. Take a look. <laughs> I have a couple lectures on it uh, in the right page. Um, and, and then they finally introduce angular momentum. And angular momentum is the rotational version of uh, momentum. And it's built in a similar way. So when you saw torque, so torque was defined this way. Torque was defined as the displacement vector cross product with the force vector. And angular momentum is defined a similar way. This displacement vector here, cross product with the, the, non, the, the translational version of angular momentum, which is momentum. So, so once you know how one rotational quantity is defined, it's, uh, um, I think it's instructive to figure out how that's uh, tied to uh, defining a similar related quantity. So you will see that in lecture. Although um, I introduced angular momentum slightly differently. This is the full vector expression is kind of the more complicated expression. So I prefer to um, introduce, I think there's an expression for that here. Uh, angular momentum is I omega somewhere. Um, this is how I prefer to introduce it, but for this to be uh, applicable, you do need uh, some um, kind of conditions, which actually your textbook, I think it talks about as it, um, uh, as it derives the angular momentum of the system of particles and the um, yeah, system of the single particle, system of particles and of reach the body. And let me see if it talks about principal axis. Oh, it doesn't. So um, what it comes down to is uh, for expression like this to be applicable, you do need um, certain conditions to meet, like uh, principal axis, that sort of stuff that uh, might get mentioned in the derivation here. And uh, what I will say is that uh, since, um, we will stay away from those um, uh, corner cases. We'll stay away from complicated scenarios. We'll stick to simple enough a scenario where this formula will always apply. But um, if you are, let's say, taking upper division uh, mechanical engineering class, uh, do be aware there may be situations where this doesn't quite apply for a rigid body because the situation you are considering is so complicated or so uh, breaks some of the rules, <laughs> some of the assumptions we are making. Um, so, so in those scenarios, what you fall back on is the definition of a single particle of mass, that angular momentum is R cross P. This is the definition. This will never be wrong. Um, and yeah. So with that, I think that's uh, that section. And for conservation of angular momentum, uh, practice using that analogy. You know, for conservation of momentum, you needed to say that the impulse imparted by net external force was at zero. So for conservation of uh, angular momentum, you say the the um, the kind of the quantity being changed due to the external uh, rotational version of force, which would be torque. So it says if there's no net external torque on the system, then the angular momentum is conserved. And um, there was the relationship between angular momentum and torque in the previous section that's, again, completely analogous to how uh, force is related to momentum. That was the relationship we had, the moment we introduced momentum. And the analogous version of that is torque is related to angular momentum this way through its time derivative. So for conservation of angular momentum, you have the same, um, you use the same thing. The, the, if the 
if net external torque is zero, then uh, through the same definition that the change of angular momentum is zero, so angular momentum is conserved. So and, and uh, with the angular with the net torque, uh, there are more interesting ways for net torque to be zero. So you know with the net force, it just had to be zero. Uh, but with the, like net external force had to be zero. But with the net torque, you could have external force, but you can have it be arranged in such a way that the lever arm is zero. And um, there are scenarios like that. Solar system is another example. Now, gravitational force, I guess uh, depending on what you consider, it would be um, internal force, not external force. I wonder if it talks about the, if we talks about the angular momentum of an orbiting body like Earth, that would be another example. On, an example where um, angular momentum is conserved, but for a different reason from here. So here you could say angular momentum is conserved because all the forces are internal forces. So net external force, no net external torque. But even if you were to consider a single object here, like a, uh, like a Saturn or Jupiter, I think, <laughs> or Mars, um, so even though there's external force on Mars from the sun, because that external force is what we call central force, as we'll talk about, I think, in a future chapter dealing with the universal gravitation, that central force uh, has a zero uh, lever arm because the line of action for the force goes through the center of rotation. So, so that leads to there being no net torque on this body. So as it's orbiting, angular momentum is conserved. And that's going to lead to something we call Kepler's law when we get to chapter 13. Um, and uh, yeah, so that's conservation of angular momentum. Now, when you look at precession, this is an example that where specifically angular momentum changes. That change of angular momentum is what leads to precession. I have some conceptual questions on that. I have some examples. And I do encourage you to think about precession and how you might derive the rate of precession uh, formula. And um, uh, uh, your textbook gives you some treatment of that, I think. Yeah, some treatment of that. And I think I've done the derivation of uh, precession rate. Um, do take a look at it. Uh, this is a question that I love asking um, people, like uh, when, um, like quizzing people on, um, people who are like physics majors, people who sh are supposed to know upper division content, like how well someone understands precession of a gyroscope tends to, uh, in my opinion, tends to be a indicator of how well someone understood the mechanics period. So, so I do encourage, especially if you uh, intend on like going on to a major in physics, uh, this is something worth spending time to understand. There are many physical systems that you will see in upper division that can be thought of as a, like a precessing system.